It's been a, quite a, a remove for me, actually. I've I just been listening to so much other stuff rather than... I've hardly listened to music, actually. I can go weeks at the moment without listening. And then I'll listen to it and then be like, oh, yeah, I love music. <laughs> and then, you know, not listen to it again. It's amazing, isn't it? But I suppose we've had music every day since we were, you know, tiny. And now we don't have to. Interesting. <laughs> The clearing headspace for you. Exactly, like just get rid of all of that music. And what do I actually think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we don't get a chance to decide that really, do we? I suppose. No, I feel like we're always on the what's next? What's yeah. next? <laughs> yeah, the hamster wheel thing is such a, I mean, you're, you're not the first person to, to say that. And um, it's obviously it's a it's a it's been a welcome break from from that but yeah. I remember when we first talked about this you were saying some interesting things about you know adrenal burnout and stuff like that which actually there's a real problems for for performers I think so I think it's a thing that we don't talk enough about but like for example last season my health was appalling and I swear half of it is to do with adrenal burnout mm -hmm because you wake up and you feel like you've been run over by a bus and then you have to turn up and be, you know, all effervescent and focused and, you know, there's no, there's no less up, is there? Well, you know, especially, and, especially if you're conducting, I think I mean, it's the, the focus is just always on you and the energy in the room drops so much if you're not there a hundred percent with your, your equipment yeah. and your focus. And yeah, I, I can't imagine that as well as the physical side of it. But I think it's the same for leaders too. I mean, you can't coast at all. Yes, but <laughs> we don't have to motivate uh, and structure and plan a whole rehearsal every time. Hmm. But yeah, I think you also have to manage the energy of the room more than me in a way, though, don't you? Because everybody's looking at you. If I, if I made a stupid comment, everyone would be like, <coughs> looking at you. And then you have to be, you know, Mrs. Diplomatic. <laughs> try and just sort, you know, make sure that the conductor feels, you know, needed and looks after. And also the orchestra too. So it's, um, I think it's a really tricky job, actually, being a leader. Yeah. Yeah, it's got its, it's, got its, um, its things, definitely. But yeah, I mean, amazing too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it is. Also your visibility every every facial expression every yes. little habit is visible and and i can't at least i can get away with you know sort of uh fiddling with my bow if i'm feeling <laughs> awkward or something like that you don't have that at all you just have it's to. true it's true actually i think i'm still learning how to keep my face still sometimes as well i think you know that's the one actually one of the things that simon rattle does really well when he's conducting he is so good at, with the face, don't you think? You know, there's no question that he's not in it. Or even if he isn't in it, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, because I've seen him rehearse as well. I mean, obviously you've worked with him, but I notice if people question him, he's, he's always got like a little joke just to throw back at them so they don't ask another question. <laughs> and it's, it's quite a good technique, actually, isn't it? He doesn't get stuck in the, oh, well, maybe we should do two, da oh, I don't know, what do you think? You know, he's just like, shut up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he can get away with it, you know, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, what's it like being asked lots of questions, especially when they seem, I guess, quite trivial sometimes, like what bow do we use? You know, it's, it may not seem like an important concept when you're looking at the bigger picture, but. Um, I quite like it sometimes, because then you feel like you're part of a team. Sometimes it's annoying, isn't it? It must be annoying for you as well, actually, when people are like, what's the bow in here, what are we doing? 
Um, it's double. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because yeah. part of me, part of me, really recognizes the the need for order and yeah, and and the, the to kind of enable people to play their best. They need to know what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's as you say, the loaded bow question was: What are you really asking? Are you asking a musical? You're are you actually questioning the 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 kind of musical phrase here and how we're doing it, or are you just asking: Is it a down or an up? Yeah. <laughs> is it now? You, obviously, you have got to keep your cool when you're being needled. It's it, how how difficult on a scale of one to impossible is it to when someone's really and I have seen it with people absolutely go for conductors it's yeah it's really silly actually isn't it i'm definitely getting better at dealing with it i used to like i used to just be a quivering mess like you know internally people might not have known externally but internally i was like ah! you just want to run out the rehearsal room but i think now i've kind of learned that it's more about them than me and it's just always reminded myself of that actually they're just doing their little thing and their little show for everyone and but it's funny, isn't it? I mean, there's the same sort of characters in every orchestra, even abroad. You know, you just, I think you just start to realise that you're not that crap at your job, that they're, you know, speaking on behalf of everyone. Because don't you find that's the problem with an orchestra? A couple of really loud voices, but the majority of opinion is completely different to the loud voices. And then you have this conflict all the time. It must be really difficult in meetings and things, because some people won't want to talk naturally, will they? And, yeah, some of yeah, some of the, the the brightest minds are sitting in places that you just don't you never hear what they what they really have to say. Yeah, it's really hard because it seems like it should be so democratic an orchestra and it's right. really not. It's really hierarchical and that's hard it's really hard to reconcile that structure with that kind of utopian ideal of oh yes, we all get a say in how it goes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> you were really young when you got that job weren't you you were it was yeah i, I was a record 24 five yeah no it was amazing i did a program of mendelssohn one um which was a symphony they hadn't done for ages and so i definitely had the upper hand advantage when i first went in and i remember being strangely nervous before going to the bbc philharmonic i saw it in my diary and you know, when you look through your diary, there's certain things you feel really comfortable about and things you think, oh, never been there before, don't know what it's about. But I remember there was this kind of little tingly feeling and I thought, oh, I'm actually really scared, but also really excited about working with this orchestra. And it was, it was really great. I loved it. And we had a great connection. And um, I think we bonded over a love of just really going for it in the concert. Because um, that's definitely my style of conducting rather than over rehearsing. Um, <laughs> or rehearsing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, I've had an amazing time with the BBC Philharmonic. It's been so good. How many years is it now? Um, well, I've been working with them for seven years, wow. but I think the job officially was three years. 
yeah it can be really it can be so amazing there so i think once this all settles down then hopefully everyone will just be a bit like, and also the schedule's been crazy there hasn't it recently yeah. i mean the, this is the first time probably in their memories that yeah. actually it's it's like a decent working pace and uh, we still we were laughing about it last week because obviously you know it's fielding half an orchestra at a time max yeah. to, to, to keep um compliant with the the space and the rules and all that and and um it means the schedule is like a normal European <laughs> orchestra <laughs> rather than right. BBC Philharmonic. <laughs> kind of crazy mad. Let's fit three programmes in this week. Yes, we can do it. <laughs> no, don't worry, it's all Schoenberg. No. Yeah, no exactly. <laughs> three different conductors as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been, um, I mean, I was looking at the, there's a spreadsheet of all the pieces I've done with the orchestra. And it's just, it's over a hundred pieces, which for a young conductor is, is amazing actually, you know, because um, the programming remit's quite interesting. You get to do the sort of symphonic standards, but also the really interesting side pieces that I'd never come across before. So composers like Foltz, um, who Zachary Oromo introduced me to um, when he was at CBSO and, you know, these sort of quirky, British composers that are really amazing actually but you'd never come across normally. When you say over 100 pieces I mean that sounds it sounds impressive but actually the time it takes to learn and really immerse yourself in over 100 pieces that that's extraordinary amount to fit it in 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 those years in, in addition to everything else that you're doing how would you say you go about learning and immersing yourself in especially if it's new if and if it's if it's something you've never even heard before yeah i think my technique for learning scores has changed dramatically and part of it is because i've got like, more efficient and quicker at learning scores but also part of it is learning i once had a lesson with uh, tony papano um i was in the lso um donatella flip final when i really shouldn't have been and he was on the panel and he said come and see me i'll teach you how to rehearse an orchestra and so I went to the opera house and he was there in his tracksuit with a kebab and um, I had the marriage of Figaro over sure. and he said come on conduct it for me um, and I started you know conducting thin air you know conducting lessons are a strange thing anyway um, and then he stopped and every bar he said what do you want here what are you going to do with this group how are you thinking about this how are they going to phrase and it was really interesting actually because I was at that point I was 22 23 where it was more about my technique rather than what I could bring to an orchestra because obviously you're still learning what this does, what that does. Um, so he really kind of showed me how to look at a score from a, not a boring point of view, but a very technical point of view. Because I think when you're younger, so you get so wrapped up in, oh, I want this phrase to sound like he smoked loads of opium or I want this to sound like they're falling in love. But actually, you know, to get something sounding like that, you need all the technical aspects in place. So I definitely approach scores now with a much more um, mechanical sense of, okay, this is what I want here, and then you can think about the overall picture. But I'll never forget the kebab lesson. I mean, that was, I was amazed that, you know, the director, the music director of the Opera House could walk around in his tracksuit eating a kebab with a mayonnaise and Donham falling everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Analyzing Mozart, yeah. Not well, quite. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, you know, it does take a long time learning music. And I think as well as a conductor, there's always a sense of, oh, did I get that right? <laughs> After the first time you've performed a piece. And the great thing about the BBC is that you can listen back on BBC Sounds for 30 days, <laughs> whether you want to or not. Um, and so I found that actually as a learning resource really valuable because you can listen back and I've developed a really good relationship with the producer there, Mike George, and he takes me into the room and says, just have a little, little listen to this. What do you think? Maybe we balance it there. And so those relationships, as well as a young conductor, are also, also really important. I don't want to use the word mentor, but there, there, there is absolutely, in recording, you can learn, I think, more than just about any other way of, of, of working. It's the fastest way to, to improve, isn't it? And I think so, yeah, because I mean, you must, but it's good. It's, it's kind of a good pain, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you must find as a player as well that you think something sounds a certain way 
and then you hear it played back and you think, okay, my perception is completely different to what I'm hearing. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, if you can overcome that kind of fear of, of hearing yourself, which I, I, we all have, I certainly have it, and mm. just kind of listen through that to get the useful information and the, and the things that need to improve, it, it's really, it's powerful. Obviously, we've all been doing recordings and things in our front rooms recently which is particularly challenging <laughs> but yeah in a studio it's it's fantastic and yeah and I, with Mike as well somebody who's that experienced and that compassionate with it because I think he is he is really very kind um that I th it really enables certainly I feel really enables me to to feel positive about you know, if something hasn't gone right, uh, that, that we can improve it and that we can definitely you know, get a better um, end result. And that's a lovely enabling thing to... Yeah, I think so. And I think Mike is particularly talented because he's so good at working out exactly where the problem spot is. And he's, like you said, he's so compassionate. I mean, he was a player himself as well. So he totally knows what everybody's going through. And I've really enjoyed actually his mentorship. He's often said no don't do that piece do this piece instead why don't you try this piece um because I think as a conductor you want to do you know, your Mahler twos and your Tarangalilas and actually you might be completely hopeless at conducting them they really might not suit you at all and so it's really good to have um a sort of secret spy who will say you know don't do this maybe try this or yeah don't go there so I mean I know I know from first-hand experience your Beethoven your Mozart your classical core classical thing is is absolutely you you just it, you just feel it instinctively naturally just beautifully but what what kind of um hidden gems have you unearthed with with mike or on your own or with somebody else what's what's come to well, life it's really interesting first of all that you say about the classical repertoire because i had to work really hard on that repertoire because as a tuba player you just don't play it and i remember my teacher at the guild hall patrick harold said by the end of your time at the Guildhall, you must have conducted every single Beethoven symphony. And I had, and I'm really grateful that he did that to me because actually it takes time to get into the classical rep, doesn't it? And I think especially as a tuba player, <laughs> you just, you are miles, you know, ahead, historically speaking. Um, so it was actually, I had to work really hard, but I love conducting that music. Um, but other composers that I've fallen in love with are definitely Stravinsky. Um, I remember in the CBSO Youth Orchestra, that was my first course, I think, and we did the Firebird. Mm. And I was a brass bander through and through. I thought orchestras are so boring, you know, brass band music's the way forward. Um, I genuinely never heard an orchestral colour and it, I was intoxicated. I know it sounds really, really cheesy and corny, but I remember sitting at the back of the, um, the rehearsal hall and I just, God, this is so cool actually just the colour and the sound around you. So I think um, Zachary helped me fall in love with Stravinsky. Um, Tchaikovsky I love as well. Um, my mum is, well, she used to play Tchaikovsky to me when I was in the womb with my sister. Um, my sister hates Tchaikovsky. <laughs> so it obviously didn't work with her.
definitely have a real love of the big sort of romantic repertoire. I'm definitely discovering a bit of Bartok as well. Um, really like that's good good challenge. Um, but the big revelation for me recently has been Anna Klein. I've just been working with her. Um, we have a project that we do together in New York every year with the Orchestra St. Luke's where we have four new composers and they write new pieces. And um, I think I've done a, well loads of her premieres actually all around. In fact, last season I think every program had a piece of hers in that I did. And I just think she is super talented and the music's really approachable but without it sounding like Disney princess. So I think it's so, you know, she's brilliant. I remember falling flat on my face with the Roica. Um, I conducted it with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra when I was incredibly young. I think I was 23. And I just didn't know what I was doing. And you know, of course the piece is really long and it's, and trying to navigate that is really tricky. And I remember just um, flailing around in one for half an hour, giving no direction at all. And then trying to pick it apart, I, it was dreadful. And I had a fear of this piece. But it was only, we did it recently, didn't we? Yeah. And it was brilliant and I loved it. But it's taken me about eight performances to get back to not feeling absolutely petrified by such a bad experience before. That's funny. They do stay with you, don't they? <laughs> how, do you, how do you do that psychologically? How do you repair that damage? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because you can literally just hear three bars of the piece and then your fear response kicks off. <laughs> they are like ghosts that sort of just hover around the back of your head. But I think um, the way I've learned to look at it is that um, the career that I have or the journey that I'm on without sounding too corny is, is a series of progressions and actually I'm developing all the time and it's not a static process. So even if it goes terribly wrong or it, it doesn't feel comfortable or I feel like I underperformed, it's all feeding into this sort of longer process. So I've definitely, but this has only been the last few months that I've really sort of keyed into this way of thinking before it would have been a terrible Berlioz mess you know existential threat um whereas now I think it's definitely uh, yeah I mean everything plays into the bigger picture even if at the time it can feel really uncomfortable I mean, that that's a, a great thing to have arrived at after months of lockdown and months of being deprived of, of doing it but you think you've really taken positives from from this break then i think so i think for me i was on um i used to go and see an osteopath literally every four weeks just to be fixed up um and she was very good at the whole looking at the adrenal side of health um because i think as a performer as a conductor as a athlete as a whatever you're always relying on adrenaline it's always there it can be your best friend but also <laughs> worst enemy um so i think for a while i've been stuck in that slightly um adrenalized state and it was really good to just stop and give myself permission to i mean you have no choice actually we had no choice did we but to have a guilt-free break from conducting was so good within three weeks i felt like a new man because you know there wasn't the demand to be really physical learn all the scores you know, sit on a plane for hours, you know, go and stay in a hotel room that's not your home. Um, but yeah, what I took away was from the whole experience, apart from obviously the really rubbish side of things, um, was a slightly more positive outlook actually on what I do and actually feeling slightly more grateful 
for the opportunities. I think I was definitely in that zone of being, okay, I'm now over 30, I should have a job, I should be doing this. You know, I had this ambition list, but I've actually, I've, I don't need that anymore. I think my ambition now is to make sure that I do my best and that I'm a honest and sort of, in, I have lots of integrity, so it's the wish now, and that I do performances that are really meaningful rather than thinking, okay, I'll do this and then that'll lead to that and then that'll lead to that. Because, you know, as a conductor, you're always quite tempted by your managers to fight for the titles with an orchestra. Um, and then if you're always in that game sort of style, you're not really conducting the music, you're sort of playing a game. And I think actually these months have sort of just helped me realise that, you know, what's important and unique is what I can offer as a performer and I should be focusing on that rather than, you know, the sort of ambitious 21 year old who wants to go, you know, conquer the world. It's really interesting because it's highlighting a lot of things that, that I'm hearing a lot of people say, which one of which is, is the very little talked about kind of physiological, psychological toll of, of playing and conducting performing i guess it goes throughout all the performing arts but the other one is this thing of industry um music the music profession versus the music industry and and those two things that don't really actually add up and they, they, they there's a very uneasy um sort of it's, it's not even a truce there's it's it's just an uneasy partnership and how hard it is for people to we, you know, we, we go into music because we love it and we, we go in realizing that there are certain um, limitations and also certain restrictions that, that, that mean that we, you know, maybe won't earn very much money and we won't, or we won't, you know, <laughs> we, there, there are things, there are things that we just accept um, as part, you know, we'll, that we'll spend our, our evenings learning uh, crazy notes instead of you know sitting in front of the television but there are there are things and you know they're not sacrifices they're, they're completely choices happily made with with love and joy but they the, the industry side of it um, shows us and I think wants us to think about music in a different way so all this idealism and this kind of uh, big heartedness kind of gets channeled into something that's not really very healthy by by the industry well i think there's definitely a, a dichotomy between people who really want to make loads of money the business side of things and then we're also taught to be extremely grateful and we should you know just be very happy that we're on stage this evening um yet yeah, we are also the products um that is being sold so i think um i don't know what i think actually <laughs> well, no, nor, do, nor do i it's it, yeah. uh, and honestly, the more people I talk to, the more people I realise, you know, we're, we're caught, we're caught in a kind of thing that we need, the industry, we need yeah. it. But, but actually, it's, it's not kind of, it sits, doesn't sit well with, with our feelings of, of wanting to be artistic with our music. And yeah. that's, a, yeah, I think from my point of view, often, yeah, you can feel squeezed as a conductor, um, because they'll say you need to go for X, Y, Z because that may be the most profitable. Um, but actually you're thinking, no, I want to do A, B, C and um, where I have much more artistic freedom and responsibility. Yeah, it is, it is tricky. I'd say by far the happiest conductors I've, I, I work with are, and some of them I think have really consciously made a choice to um, turn their backs on that and actually just focus on um, their artistic of ideals and uh, uh, you need a bit of both definitely and I mean, the thing is uh, if you're on the path already and you've been on the path since you were early 20s mm. getting off that is is not a straightforward thing but there must be a way to combine the two approaches that uh, surely I think so and I think now has to be the time that everybody re-evaluates this um you know is it healthy a for the planet or B for the individual to be hopping around, jumping on planes all the time, given concerts where you're completely exhausted and people are paying through the roof to see you. Um, is that really a fair model? I really think that I was actually quite excited about the opportunity of 
orchestras in this country, for example, being able to use musicians from this country. You know, there is such a wealth of talent that is so often overlooked for the star figures or the people from abroad. But there are so many talented people in this country that I hope, I really hope going forward that British orchestras, at least anyway, will start looking closer to home because it's something that should have happened years ago, frankly. Yeah, I mean, it's investing, isn't it? And if it doesn't happen, well, then you end up in a few generations time with, with no one from Britain being able to, you know, our supposedly world beating culture it's, it's not going to exist. If you don't, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you came from obviously school age playing the tuba through youth orchestra can you chart this journey for for me because it's a it's a fantastic example of what investment um at an early age or what results it yields yeah well i my first introduction to music was by my mum who was a special needs music teacher and she used to in fact she taught me when i was in year five this was before she became a special needs teacher and um she made me play piano in assembly. So I was knocking out the hymn tunes for um, my primary school when I was, you know, eight or nine. Uh, so that was a really good sort of initial introduction. And then um, my dad conducted the local brass band in Newport and um, they really wanted to play the tuba. So he came home one day with this massive case and said, what do you think? Um, <laughs> I know this sounds like an episode of Brass Off, but it really wasn't that glamorous. Um, and so I kind of learned to play the tuba and I, I loved it actually, it was really good. Um, I went to Adams Grammar School in Newport and I had a really good director of music there called Nick Moore who I remember at 15 saying I really want to do some conducting and he just let me conduct the school orchestra for three years and we did um, you know pieces like Gladiator and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, all those really fun pieces um, and it was great because I I was given this responsibility to conduct the choirs and the orchestra and accompany. Um, I accompanied all the exams. I mean, it was brilliant. It was kind of like a mini conservatoire training already at the age of 15. So that was great. Um, then I wanted to be a doctor and realised I was totally hopeless at chemistry and biology and physics. Um, so <laughs> I wrote that one off. Um, but I also I remember going to the Guilds Hall for my audition. And I'd just been to the academy the week before and I, you know, you have to do that serious um, theory test, which I am hopeless at. Um, so I didn't go particularly well. It also felt quite like a museum. I thought, I don't know if this is quite the place for me. Anyway, so I went to Girls Hall and it was Christmas and they had the Christmas tree up and um, there were two actors pushing each other around in a trolley, um, not wearing much. And I thought, actually, this is the place where I want to go. Um, and I had a great teacher there called Patrick Harold. Um, and I have to say at this point, I knew nothing about classical music, genuinely. First week of college, we had a, like a student's union trip to the Barbican. And it was Richard Hickox conducting uh, Carmina Burana. And I remember thinking, okay, this is really good. This is what it's about. Actually, before I went to the Gortel, I was also in the CBSA Youth Orchestra. Um, and actually, this was a really integral part of me growing up as a conductor and a musician because I remember I'd never played in an orchestra and then at 17 I, I got on the trains of Birmingham New Street from Telford and uh, was there walking with my tuba on my back and uh, I was presented with an orchestral schedule which at the age of 17 you <laughs> just think what on earth is this one of my free periods um, <laughs> <laughs> it was so nice to sort of have a little glimpse you were treated like a professional musician for a week and that was really interesting and I thought that was a really great investment to make actually and then um, I remember Mike Seal did a conducting masterclass with me as well and I think I was probably that really annoying person in the orchestra that was always badgering the conductors when they were having a fag outside saying I want to be a conductor what do I do um, but I remember Zachary and Mike so the CBS Youth Orchestra was a great introduction to how to be a professional musician I loved it um, but at the Guildhall, I got introduced to Sir Colin Davis, and that was really magical, actually. I remember I lived, well, I was lodging with a very eccentric couple in, it's called Highbury uh, Crescent. So it's very, very well-to-do area in Islington. And around the corner, Colin Davis lived just in front of Highbury Fields, you know, these great big um, Georgian townhouses with a huge door. 
And I remember the first time I went knocking on this door and you know, waiting for what seemed an eternity. And then he opened it in a sort of very slow and stately manner. And he said, come in. <laughs> and I, you know, I was sweating and all sorts. Um, but it was incredible because he had this music room at the front of the house that overlooked the park and, you know, walls full of scores and busts of various composers. And I remember being in his presence was confusing because he was very philosophical. He never gave you a straight answer. But I realised over time, this was all deliberate. Because I remember at the time thinking, oh, I don't even understand this Mozart anymore now. But actually over the years, what he taught me and what he said just slowly trickles in. Isn't that the best kind of teacher? Because you know, you're so desperate to know, aren't you, when you're young? You know, what's right, what's wrong? And actually, there is no right or wrong in music, right? And I think that, yeah, Colin gave me that sense of, well, trying to find a sense of calm. I know he, he spoke to me, that he, he said it took him a really long time just to, you know, the Colin Davis we knew, well, that I knew when he was 80, the last five years of his life. He was a very upright individual and very calm and his movements came very naturally and he was always breathing. But I remember he said when he was younger, he was a horrible, angry young man. <laughs> um, and he, had, he also had a break from conducting where he said he reevaluated everything and became much calmer. So I always try and go back to that idea that sometimes as a conductor you want to be, you know, shoving loads of energy in people's faces, but sometimes actually standing back is also really good too. To, to find the space in it, that, that I have to say, I, that's for me uh, the bit of conducting that I find most mysterious. Uh, timing and space <laughs> and the breathing thing because yeah I, mean, I can I can kind of at this point get my head around playing the violin and and the sort of gestures of, of that you know help people play together I can I can start to say I'm, I'm beginning to understand those but that having that sort of big overview of 80, 100 people and the collective time and breath, that's, those things fascinate me. And Yeah, and don't you find as well that, I mean, you must find this when you're guest leading with other orchestras, that every orchestra plays sl slightly different plays on the beat. So, I mean, <laughs> it must be really terrifying actually when you don't know an orchestra and, you know, you put the downbeat down, <laughs> you don't want to be the first person to, um, but it's amazing how every orchestra plays completely differently. Yeah. Um, I kind of prefer it when orchestras play behind the beat um, right. just because it gives you time to really show what you want and I think somehow the sound can be a lot warmer I think. Uh, yeah because and the, there's that collective breath thing that can happen a little bit more yeah yeah it, it is really it is really different I've yeah played with orchestras that play so far behind the beat that the, the element of, of that hesitation becomes almost a fear that's uh, yeah. so that's also not helpful for for i think mm. especially i don't know you tell me what's that like for a brass player sitting at the back trying to predict so much that's another i, I, get. I know right because there's the whole breath and the tongue and the embouchure to engage before you even you don't want brass players sort of asphyxiating themselves at the back of the stage before playing their first note. Um, but yeah, and no, I think that's really tricky, isn't it? And then, you know, I feel sorry for brass players because you're always saying, no, you're too loud, you're too early, you're too late. It's quite confusing for them, I see. Um, but I just love somehow, for example, with the London Symphony Orchestra, when you, there's just that slight delay in the string sound, but then it just sounds so glorious, doesn't it, when it comes back at you. And I've, I remember hearing Colin with the orchestra so much, and he had this great sweeping gesture. And they, I don't, I've never heard another conductor create the same sound with an orchestra as what he did with them. And it, you just sit there, you know, and you smile, and everything sort of just it feels amazing. And he was just like, you know, it was incredible, incredible. That, that gesture is, I, is that one you get told not to do when you're being taught <laughs> kind of big sweeping gesture? You, you get taught to keep everything in a, in a box, don't you? Or very, yeah, you do. Yeah, here's your washing yeah. line. Yeah, yeah. And then somebody goes and breaks the rules like that and it feels great. It feels great. You can, I think it's that visual cue as well, especially when you're a string 
player that yeah. seeing somebody do that is is a real freeing thing for for us because we can copy it because there's not much if you think about if you think about the gestures of a conductor and the gestures of a string player there's not much um that we can actually copy um well i guess for a wind player as well it's an interesting one isn't it because you're you're doing something that's not it's not against what we're doing at all but it's not it doesn't imitate any instrument until you start, you get the kind of freedom and the people who do creative things with their their non time beating hand and 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 show shapes and stuff like that that's i think yeah we respond to that definitely but well i think also as a conductor it's much more liberating as well but i was taught by sean edwards at the same time as colin and she instilled in me that the Moosin technique, the Russian technique of everything being really, you know, clear and precise and that you pick up the beats and you place them over here. But one thing she really taught me was that you have to imagine that the sound is in your hands and your fingers. And something I've really enjoyed sort of breaking the rules, if you like, um, is trying to paint players rather than play it here. Yeah. And that's something that I still experiment with. But I, the, the most fun I have as a conductor is when I feel I can sort of just paint the sounds and the colours and the textures rather than it just being, you know, a bashy beating time exercise. Yeah, I do. I, the thing of painting, definitely I can respond to that. I, I can mm. picture that and, and that, that feels... It's either painting or in some conductors, I think the physicality comes across as, as sort of um, more almost... I don't want to use sport analogies, but, but kind, in, a, in a kind of you get a, a feeling of, of motion that I guess you get from, a, you know, the great tennis players or something like that. You, you get, you get a, an impetus um, yeah. from there or a flight or something that, that you can also then physically respond to, I guess, um, on yeah. any instrument that you, you feel that. Um, but don't you think as well, it's the uh, sort of the role of the conductors changed so considerably. You know, when we talk about the older conductors and you say that they look like bandmasters and, you know, you look at Adrian Bolt, they had this you know, huge long bat on and he's tapping people on the head saying, shut up, young man. Um, you know, you could never get away with that now. Um, or you see John Barbarotti, you know, rehearsing and he's screaming at the orchestra. He's like, you're behind, no, really. Um, and he's also very, you know, he's sort of bandmastery. But I don't know, I think musicians want to need something different now. And I don't know if it's because it's a different way of playing in an orchestra or actually generally I don't know obviously I couldn't possibly comment on the standards of orchestral playing in history I've no idea um so I think that actually the job of the conductors changed I think also the power dynamics changed as well um no longer is it the case that the conductor hires and fires rightly um players um I think that's a dangerous place to be in for anyone um but it's also yeah conductors are kind of expected to do different things now aren't they what do you think oh, absolutely yeah and i think also yes again I, I can't possibly comment on standards of orchestra playing i think i think they've been sort of golden eras and and they've been you know lots but we are we're trained to be individuals now i think in a way that that maybe um is different you know i think music college is, is a very different thing these days than what it used to be and um I th as a result we don't we don't want to be in a in an environment necessarily as as musicians where, professional musicians where we are um being shown for one of our and we play together and that's it um although i think the the kind of unanimity of like new philharmonia under temper you know it's just not that's not achievable now that mm. they all play with the same amount of bow in the same part of the bow the sound is extraordinary it mm. is extraordinary and he obviously could shape that and create something you know magical absolutely mm. magical but we don't we aren't trained like that now we don't think like that now so yeah it's, it's answering a different need now a conductor i think the conductors who can encourage that positive individualism somehow or individuality or whatever the word is um that's great because it, it gives us a kind of a feeling of, of a small freedom in a in a big machine so yeah i think it's a series of sort of bargains isn't it where the conductor will give you a kind of framework but then allow a little bit of freedom within it as well 
so you I'm as a conductor giving freedom but you're also giving freedom back as well so it's a yeah it's not just a, a straightforward case of the conductor comes in and says this is what's happening shut up and get on with it um I think that would be particularly dangerous actually with with this with this approach of kind of enabling rather than forcing um obviously it gets great results you've, you've obviously you know i'd love to hear some of your highlights but have has it has it ever been a problem have you yeah. encountered yeah i think um especially when i was younger as well when colin used to say just let everyone breathe you just relax i may have taken that a little bit too far so i may have you know cancelled days of rehearsals and i may have finished very early and you know, it's a, <laughs> it's kind of a problem of my training in that respect, because, you know, if you're one of the best conductors in the world, i.e. Colin Davis, with one of the best orchestras in the world, i.e. the LSO, it's a totally different way of working, actually. Um, and I have definitely come a cropper, because I've now realised that actually orchestras expect a conductor to fix things, and they expect them to, you know, deal with problems. Um, but this has taken me a really long time to learn um, and it's something I still have to learn um, and each each orchestra is completely different so you might go to one orchestra and then they might call your manager at the end of the week and say oh he's so boring all he did was rehearse all the time or you'll then go to another orchestra the week after and say he didn't rehearse enough never want to see him again so it's actually it's a conductor it's really hard to um, kind of just navigate that and this is why at this point in my career, I love working with orchestras that I know because there's already that level of trust. You know, if you've already done a few performances with an orchestra, um, you kind of know what you're dealing with and what's achievable. So everybody just kind of just goes, okay, I don't need to help or kind of try and micromanage as well. Um, but also it's part of my personality. And, you know, it's hard as well because actually I want to trust everyone and I want to believe that Actually, everybody would really give their best and, you know, an orchestra that's slightly on the edge of the seat for everybody feeling, let's do it, is incredible. You know, you only have to look at Valery Gergiev's performances sometimes and, you know, the, the hit rate might be, you know, questionable, but when it's so amazing, it's so amazing. And I'm not advocating never rehearsing, but I do think um, there is a certain liberation that comes actually um when you trust the people around you yeah we really feel that definitely it's good to be trusted yeah we've trained for it and practiced and right well that's the thing isn't it you know and, you know you spent years learning you know and studying and performing and you know we're all on this journey aren't we well most of us are of wanting to be better at every time we perform and wanting to always reflect and I think it can be dangerous as a performer to reflect too much but I think again what I've learned is a little bit of reflection is really helpful if it's channeled in a way of going okay I'm looking forward all the time. I spent a year with the Los Angeles Philharmonic that was amazing as the Dudamel Fellow so I was assisting Gustavo and all the visiting conductors and it meant that I could conduct at the Hollywood Bowl to 16,000 people and that was really cool um, and um, Gwyneth Paltrow and Jack Black came to the concert and came and said hello at the end. So, you know, I was totally absorbed in this weird and wonderful world of Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> so that was, professionally, I learned a lot doing that, actually. Um, I love conducting opera. So I've had some, some of the most fun conducting. I did Madame Butterfly two years ago in Sweden, at the Royal Swedish Opera, and I just loved it. So much so that I proposed to my wife at the end of the run because it was just just everything was such a positive experience and and then we got married last year which was great and um so yeah there's been some really amazing you know highlights recently and that's a fantastic thing to be going forward with so obviously the ballet russe cycle is is and i'm, I'm guessing opera is on 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 the wish list as well oh yeah i definitely um i would love i would genuinely love one day to run an opera house that would be my dream actually um there's something about being in the pit and having all of these things around you and that moment when the lights go down and that little bit of silence just before it kicks off that sense of anticipation i just find well it's just a 
addictive <laughs> something and I know sanghas can be a real pain in the bum sometimes but there is genuinely a great joy in joining up the pit and the singers and the lighting and the costumes and the direction um, so I'm really hoping to do um, yeah definitely a lot more Puccini and Verdi I've done a lot of Mozart opera already so a little bit more of that would be nice as well um, more ballet russe repertoire um, I love the choral um, and orchestra, chorus and orchestra repertoire too, so I'd love to do a bit more of that. Um, but also I think going forward, we need to be talking to our audiences a lot more than we do at the moment. I think this has really highlighted that actually our audiences need us, but we also need them. And I think it's time we also start listening to what they also want to pay to hear too. You know, there are lots of amazing things we can bring to an audience and pieces maybe that people have never heard before or different interpretations. But I actually would really, going forward, like to start listening to a lot more to what people want to hear too. What, do you, what would you say to young conductor now going into it? I don't think it's what you think it's going to be. But maybe that's true of everyone that goes into classical music, I don't know. <laughs> We're keen to discover what you enjoy about these episodes and how we might build on this venture. We'd be delighted if you made a comment on the YouTube or Vimeo page where you're watching this, or go to the Music Room page of the Shropshire Music Trust website to tell us what you think. Thank you for watching.